Psalm 112. Read this with me. It says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Let's pray. Father, today I ask in the next few moments that you would speak to our hearts individually as well as corporately what it means to delight in the commandments of the Lord, what it means to fear you, what it means to enjoy the blessings of God, which are multitude. So in this place, Lord God, we open our hearts to you and say, have your way, work in us to will and do your good pleasure. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And for several weeks we've been on this going through Psalm 112 and really talking about what it means to be a person that the Lord blesses. How many like blessings? Come on, they're better than a curse. Blessings are good. But see, God wants to bless us, and he does bless us, but he wants us to really live in the maintaining of his blessings. And that takes a person who's complete, who's mature, who's stable, who's fixed, who's established in the Lord. Psalm 37, it puts it this way. It says, Mark the blameless man, King James Version, says perfect man. And observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. We found out that none of us are perfect in our flesh. How many found out you made a few mistakes, you know, and then you got out of bed this morning? So, you know, we make mistakes regularly. So, but we're perfect on the inside by the Spirit of God, but then he's perfecting his work on the inside of us, all right? And and, and really, our, our challenge is, is since the creation of man, we have an enemy. His name is Satan or Lucifer. And what he does is he comes and he tries to put doubt in our hearts. You remember the very first temptation of man. He came and said, did God say? doubting God. And he wants to keep us double-minded. Well, did God say, well, I know God said, but my situation. See, we need to say, my situation says this, but God says this. And as a matter of fact, we got those t-shirts coming and little rubber bracelets uh, that just say dot, 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 but God. And so we'll have those in a couple of weeks. We'll get those for you. You need to start speaking to your situation that God has a different answer on what you're facing. And that's really what faith is. And so it says in James 1.8 that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so the devil knows that if he can get us double-minded, we're going to be unstable. We're going to be wishy-washy. Come on. We're going to trust God one moment and doubt him the next. And that's where he wants to get us so that our faith really uh, gets to a place where it's ineffective. Well, God wants our faith to be effective, and that takes regular maintenance, and it takes us becoming complete, mature, stable, fixed in the Lord, because prosperity flows from the inside out, and you and I cannot obtain or sustain outward prosperity in any area for very long if we're not prospering on the inside. You can come into a great relationship, but if you're not prospering, you'll ruin that relationship. You can come into some amount of money, in it, but if you're not prospering on the inside, that money will grow wings and fly. How many found that out? Your money, money just, one thing money does, it spends. How many ever found that out? It really does. And so you need to direct your money. And, and there's just so many things that God tells us in the Word about that. But we cannot, cannot obtain or sustain outward prosperity if we're not prospering inside. Because the truth is, God wants us blessed, happy, peaceful, and prosperous. But we need to be willing, obedient, allowing him to work on the inside of us. We found out in Psalm 112, verse 2, it says, His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. So not only are these blessings for you and I, but they are for the generations to come. So it's important that we get a hold of this because, listen, there's a whole generation coming up that doesn't know the Lord. And if they do know the Lord and have been introduced to him, they need someone to mentor them and to teach them the wisdom, the fear of the Lord, and the blessings of God. And so more in balance than just the blessings in your life, it's for a generation even that has not been born yet. Psalm 115 says, may the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. The kingdom of heaven is about increase. God doesn't want us to stay the same, and so we should be growing in the blessings of God in every area of life. In fact, God wants us financially prosperous. Verse 3 of Psalm 112 says, Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. In fact, in the Hebrew language, the word wealth means wealth, riches, substance, enough sufficiency, to possess riches, to be in a position of ease, how many like to be in a position of ease? Come on, be true. You can't, you, can't, you can't lie in church. It's nice to have things easy. The Bible says we have to work, and we're rewarded for our, our work. But how many know it's nice to have enough money in the bank? How many have found that out? Money can't buy happiness, but money in the bank sure can make you feel happy. Come on. I mean, it's so true. And, and, and God wants us to have more than enough. 
It says riches, here's the Greek, or the Hebrew rather, meaning of riches, to accumulate, to prosper, to be happy, to enrich. God wants our lives to be happy and to enrich others in every area of our lives, including finances. Now, this morning, we want to continue and start talking about verse 4 in Psalm 112. He says this, Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. So we've already established God wants to freely bless us. He wants us to live happy lives, peaceful lives, prosperous lives. We receive his promises through the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is the good, perfect, acceptable word of God. In fact, you cannot obtain and maintain the blessings of God if you're not a person that's in the word of God regularly. If you don't know that you've got it, you don't know that you've got it. Boy, that, that, was real, that was real deep right there. I'll say it again. If you don't know that you've got it, you don't know that you've got it. And you've got it right here. But until you find out that you've got it, you live like you don't. And God wants to change that. Say today, today. that's changing. And so we need to believe God and take him at his word, and we need to be in the word, and, and that is really just the truth. But if we're going to maintain his blessings, which he definitely pours out in our lives, then there are characteristics that God wants us to embrace. Now, we don't necessarily like to hear about character and God building us, but listen, he's at work in us, the Bible says, giving us the desire and the power, say power, to do the things that please him. So God really wants to work on the inside, but am I allowing him to? And the way he works is to build character on the inside so that not only will we receive the blessings, but we can maintain those blessings, not only for us, but as we've already said, the generations to come. That makes sense. And so it takes character. He wants us to be men and women of character. And the truth is, out of our soul, our inner man, our mind, our will, our emotions, either going to flow the fruit of the Spirit or the works of the flesh. That's what Galatians chapter 5 is all about. God wants us to make a choice to walk in the Spirit. Oh, I know, I know. You say, well, I'm, I'm Holy Ghost filled, born again. You know, and Jesus said that a man who's born of the Spirit is just like the wind. You never know if he's coming or going. Listen, that, 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 that is a misinterpretation of that Scripture. Jesus was comparing the Holy Spirit as a wind. He just comes and he blows in freshness, say fresh, into your lives, new wine into our lives. He makes us new. He makes us fresh. Remember when the Holy Spirit first came that day on Pentecost, the Bible said that he came as a mighty rushing what? Wind. All right? Jesus wasn't saying you should live your life not knowing whether you're coming or going. That's really just an excuse to be undisciplined. God wants us disciplined. The Holy Spirit's very disciplined. If you study the, the life of Jesus Christ, Jesus was extremely disciplined. He met with those he wanted to meet with. He didn't meet with others. In fact, there were times they were looking for him, and they were prodding, and they were pressing, and the Bible says he just slipped out of the midst. He just kind of said, I'm out of here. I mean, no, it's great to be around people, but sometimes you just got to be out of here. You need to discipline yourself. So often we'll see Jesus is, is, is retreating into the wilderness to, to be alone. He gets up early in the morning. He prays to the Father. Listen, if Jesus had a disciplined life, how many know we might need one? And so really it's just maintaining the spirit, keeping our flesh under control. That's why fasting and prayer is so important. That's why we talk about it in this church. We should be fasting and praying. In fact, pray about this. Join us this year. Uh, we are asking that the whole church would fast and pray on Wednesdays. Okay, maybe you can do that for part of the day. Maybe you can take the whole day. What does fasting mean? Go without food. Even if you can't do the whole day, skip a meal. If you can join us on Wednesday nights at 7, every service, our midweek services, is worship and prayer. It's, it's great. If you've never come to one, I encourage you to come on out. 7 o'clock, we try to wrap up around 8. You know, it goes, it goes a little long because, you know, when you're born of the Spirit, you just the wind is going to get out. Sometimes it goes a little bit long. But we try, to, we try to keep it timely, and you can come and go. You can leave if you have a commitment or need to go somewhere. We understand it's the middle of the week. But we should be a people who are fasting and praying regularly. It's so hard. In fact, I believe it's impossible to discern the voice of God on a regular basis if you're not a person of prayer and fasting. If Jesus had to do it, I have to do it. You have to do it so he can build character. Say character. On the inside, Proverbs 20, it says, The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. See, God's spirit comes on the inside and searches our heart. David prayed that great prayer. Oh, Lord, search me and know me. Let me ask you this morning, does God know you? Are you allowing him to reveal your innermost thoughts? And then beyond that, allowing him to come in and to help you to remove that bitterness, to remove that anger. 
to remove that passive spirit that's been put on you because you're tired of fighting with everybody. To have him come in and remove that loss that you just can't seem to get over. Listen, when we, when we, how many know it's hard to lose a loved one? How many know that? It, you, you, many times you're mourning the rest of your life. But it's really unhealthy when we can't get past that and continue in life. Listen, we'll always have memories of those who, who we've lost, and that's impossible to get rid of. And we need to have compassion on people. We'll talk about that in a moment. But if you're here this morning and there's someone that, that you've lost and you haven't been able to break free that, you know, even daily and weekly you can't get on with normal life, that's not what God has for you. You'll always remember them. There'll always be loss and some hurt attached to that because you miss them dearly. But God doesn't want to control your life. I hope that makes sense to you this morning. And so the Spirit of God wants to come inside. He wants to change those things, search those hurts and those, those things on the inside of us. Romans eight fourteen it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. Now, Galatians 5, and 23, I love what it says. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, then we need to know the kind of fruit the Spirit is producing in our lives. Listen to this. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Just read it with me. Say, love, joy, peace, long suffering. What does long suffering mean? Suffering long with those who don't deserve it. That's what, that's what long suffering, okay. Suffering long in your situation. It really is. Kindness, let's read on. Goodness, faithfulness, verse 23. Gentleness, self-control. You probably don't like that word self-control, but it's the truth. I mean, it's, it's really about maintaining what God has given us, and he pours his spirit on the inside. But the Bible tells us that we can, in fact, quench the spirit of God. And quenching the spirit of God comes when we're satisfying our flesh only, and we live only to please the flesh and the natural man. Oh, God, God wants to bless us in the natural as well as spiritual. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus has blessed us with both natural and spiritual things, all things, somebody say all things, that he wants to bless us with. But if the natural man and the natural life are more important to us than the peace and the long-suffering and the gentleness and the kind-heartedness and the things he wants to work on the inside, then we're missing what God has for us. He wants us to be full of the Spirit of God. In fact, we read in Psalm 112, verse 4, and I think all nine of these gifts are wrapped up in three things that we saw in Psalm 112, verse 4. Number one, grace. Number two, compassion. Number three, righteousness. Let me read a, a dictionary's a, I said translation. What do you call it? It's not a translation. Diction, definition, thank you. It would be a translation if I was translating. All right. So definition in Webster's Dictionary, not Bob Webster, but William, Merriam Webster. That, that's his older, older sister. No. And so this is what it says about grace. It says this, disposition or an act of instance of kindness, courtesy, clemency, the quality or state of being considerate or thoughtful. So the question is, am I a considerate, thoughtful person? Do I think about others or is my life all about me? Also the traits of benevolence, courtesy, kindness, mercy, virtue, excellence, merit, and charity are related to grace and graciousness. You see, it's almost like reading Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of God's Spirit. It's all wrapped up in what the definition of grace is. Am I kind? Do I have mercy? Do I have virtue? Is God building excellence on the inside of me? When I look at something, do I say, how can I make this better? Or am I a person that just complains every time and say, boy, if they got this right around here, maybe my job would be a little bit easier. Well, how can you get it righter and make your job better? That's the question. See, God wants us to view things and change the situation and make it better. Number two, compassion, defined in the dictionary, sympathetic, consciousness of others. Distress together with a desire to alleviate it. Distress together with a desire to alleviate it. See, God wants us to see a situation, feel a little bit stress or concern about it, but then have a plan to help alleviate that pain, to help bring and meet a need somewhere. See, that's what God has called us to do, not to make the problem worse, but to make the problem go away. Come on, somebody. Everywhere Jesus went, the Bible says that he was moved with what? Compassion on the multitudes, and he healed their diseases. He's given us that power by the Spirit of God. But the question is, am I allowing the Spirit of God to work compassion on the inside? And to do that, we really need to allow the Spirit to work and get us to a place where we start to see people the way God sees them. 
I'll never forget when I, when I was just a young believer, I, I wanted desperately to see the people in my family come to Christ. And one of those was my father. He's gone on to be with the Lord. But he came into a relationship with Jesus at 58 years old. And I remember I wanted him dearly to, to know the Lord. And, and I was praying. And I was kind of angry because when I shared my experience, when I got saved at 31 years old, I went and saw him, and I was just, I was excited. I was carrying my, my Bible everywhere. I'd become one of those Bible thumpers that I went to high school with who gave their hearts to the Lord in high school, and we used to smoke dope together, but then they started bringing their Bibles. Well, I became that at 31. And I went to tell my dad, and boy, barely did I get the story out of, out of my mouth, and he said, I don't want to hear about your Jesus. I have peace with my God. He didn't want to talk about it. And so I knew he was angry, but I was mad. I was so upset, and I would pray and say, Lord, I just, I'm so mad that my dad responded that way. And I was harboring this unforgiveness towards my father that the Lord revealed to me. And I'll never forget one morning in prayer. It was just in a split second the Lord took me through this vision where I saw my father as a little boy of maybe two or three as a toddler and just growing up into the man that he was. And he said, you don't know the things he went through that caused him to be the way he is, and you don't have compassion on the way that he acts and treats people. Broke my heart. I mean, I can remember it as clear as day. Broke my heart. It was only a matter of weeks, and you know, my, 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 my father got saved. Someone else led him to the Lord. God just had to get me out of the way. Come on, I couldn't lead him to the Lord. Sometimes you can't lead the people to the Lord that you love the dearest. You need to pray for them, and somebody else can do it. I mean, come on. It's kind of hard to lead someone to the Lord when they wiped your butt and they know how nasty you are. Come on, it's so true. And so you need to pray that God does something else, but, but allow him to work on the inside of you so that your prayers are effective. You can't have an effective prayer life if you're bitter and angry and self-consumed, and God doesn't want us to live that way. So he wants us to have distress together with a desire to alleviate it, to, to touch somebody's need. Also connected to empathy, kind-heartedness, mercy, sensitivity, benevolence, generosity, goodwill, large-heartedness, and philanthropy. Listen, this is the life of a child of God. That when we come into a situation, we make it better, we make it stronger, we make it more prosperous, we make it more blessed. Boy, when we come around, people shouldn't say, oh, here they come again. I mean, if, if that's the way your life is, you need to ask God to change you from the inside out. So when people see you come, they're like, oh, I know they're going to have something good for me. I know they're going to have a good word. I know they're going to have a good attitude. What, what do you bring with Listen, there's something you can control. A friend of mine, I called him this week, and I said, oh, this isn't going right, that isn't going right. And I was just sharing some things with him because our schedules were kind of going to cross, and I had to change some things, and I said some things were not working out, and we can't get together the way that I thought. And he, and he says to me, he's, he attends this church, he says, a wise man once said to me, don't you, you hate it when your congregation starts to preach at you, but he says, a wise man once said to me, you can't control your circumstance, but you can control your attitude. I said, my attitude is just fine, thank you very much. I mean, no, God's still working on the inside of me. But you can. You can control your attitude. You can take a situation, and you can make a blessing out of it. You can make a blessing out of it. So do I take a situation that would be really negative and turn it around for good? That's what Joseph did. Remember, Joseph waited some 40 years to inherit the blessings of God, to be reunited with his family. Remember, he was sold into slavery, ended up in a dungeon, accused of something he never did. He still prayed for people. God brought him out and put him in second in command. And when he was finally reunited with his brothers, they said, you, want, you meant evil for me, but, but God, there's that but God again. He said, but God turned it around for my benefit, for my good. Are you willing to allow God to work in you, in your circumstance, in your crappy situation, so that others can see that even when you're under stress, you don't lose it? Even when you're crushed, come on, somebody, you're not in despair. It doesn't matter what you're going through on the outside. You're refined on the inside. The fi refiner's fire is burning on the inside of you. He's making precious gold out of you and silver and jewels. I mean, that's what God wants to do in us because, you know, yeah, life sucks sometimes, but don't let it suck the life out of you. Help me out, somebody. Don't let it do that. You need to keep a good attitude. So we read it in Psalm 112. God wants to give us grace, wants to give us compassion. And finally, righteousness. This is what righteousness means, to be just, to be lawful, to be right in one's conduct. Do I have good conduct? Correct. 
doesn't mean you always have to be right. I thought I'd better throw that in for somebody. You don't always have to be right. It means you always need to be correct. Sometimes in your pursuit of being right, you are desperately wrong. First service didn't get that, so that was for somebody sitting in these chairs right here. It's also connected with decency, goodness, honesty. Am I an honest person? Am I honest? <laughs> oh, my goodness. If they give me too much change and I realize that when I leave the store, do I go back and pay it back to them? I've done that. People are like, what? I will never forget somebody gave me so much change, and I'm thinking, this, is wrong. this ain't right. I wasn't really thinking about it. They gave me my change back. I, I was kind of distracted, and I got... I literally came back the next day. I'm not kidding you. I remember it was over here at Walmart. And I said, you gave me $20 too much yesterday. Oh, no, I didn't. She didn't want to fight with me because she probably thought she'd be in trouble. I said, no, you definitely did. I said, here's my receipt, and I know you gave me this back. I said, so I'm going to give you this 20 bucks. If it comes up short, you can make sure that you know what happened. If not, I guess you get 20 bucks. Am I willing to do that? As a man of God, as a, as a woman of God, am I going to live with a high moral standard. That's what it means to be someone who is full of virtue, honor, someone who can be respected. See, because a double-minded person is bound by rejection, rebellion, and bitterness, and therefore we're self-consumed, so we cannot walk in these characteristics. It's impossible. All we think of is we get up in the morning and say, surely my life sucks more than anybody's. Anybody ever felt like this? Come on, let's be honest. You can't get better if you don't admit what the problem is. Say, oh, man, this life of mine is terrible. That's where prayer comes in. I'm so thankful when people say, I need prayer. My life sucks right now. And say, thank you, Jesus, for someone who's honest. And then we just pray through it. But, but, but you got to admit that, with, that you have a problem first if you're going to get fixed. And so really what happens is we got this rejection, this rebellion, this bitterness on the inside. Therefore, we cannot be gracious compassionate to people because we're so consumed. We think, oh, my life is terrible. Things are going to go bad today, and surely they'll be worse tomorrow. It's hard for us throughout the day. We're thinking about our troubles and how people have, have mistreated us in our past, and, and we just heap all these things on us, and we don't see the person that desperately needs compassion, the person that needs to be shown grace the way God has shown us grace, the person that needs us to be righteous in a situation and be honest and help them and turn their situation around because we're so consumed with our own situation. Listen, we need to be people of prayer, turn our problems over to God, and say, God, I know you got my back. Now use me to help somebody else. That's really how God wants us to live. You help other people with their problems. I'll tell you what, I would rather have God working on my problems than me. <laughs> me trying to work on my problems got me the problems in the first place. Is anybody with me? Now, that's no excuse to just stay stupid your whole life. Come on, I should have had a V8. So God wants us to change. That's what this is all about, building character. But listen, God can work out a whole lot better than you if you just be honest. So you can have grace and compassion and righteousness on the inside. But the truth is, so many of us live just the opposite way. I want to read a portion of Galatians 5. Don't have it in our notes, so if you want to write this down, this is kind of an extra. We've been talking about it a bit, but I want to read it from the Word of God. In verse 19, we'll start. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. Are you a contentious person? Are you fighting with everybody? Because a lot of us go through, well, I don't commit adultery. I don't commit fornication. I'm not lewd. I, I'm, I, I'm not idolatrous. Oh, you better s slow down on that one. <laughs> Remember, any, an idol is anything that we trust, love, and obey. If something in our life causes us to not trust, love, and obey God, it's an idol. That, that's the simplest way I can deny it. We think, well, I didn't, put it, I didn't build an idol. Listen, if you can't live without something, it's an idol. A person can be an idol. Yeah, yourself, you can be an idol. Absolutely. Your own self-righteousness can become an idol. And you want everybody else to worship at your altar. <laughs> All right? But sorcery, hatred, let me see, you say, well, sorcery. You know, you know that manipulation is sorcery and witchcraft? Manipulating someone to get your own way. That's sorcery. People say, I don't work witchcraft. If you're a manipulator, you are working witchcraft. That's what, that's what it is. And so many people just manipulate people to get their way. 
It's so unhealthy. It's, it's ungodly. If, if we live this way, it is literally quenching the Spirit of God because remember, the Spirit of God is love, gentleness, kindness, all those things we read, compassion, graciousness, all those things. But it says here then, how about this? Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions. Am I causing people dissension everywhere I go? Again, I, I said this earlier, but am I the person at work that says, boy, if we just get a new manager around here, things would be fine. You shouldn't be talking to people on break like that. Sometimes they may not listen to you if you have a better word to speak over that boss. And in fact, some of those things may be true that they say, but it still doesn't make it right. How about you just be a good employee and you work as hard as you can and God will help you solve the problem. And if it doesn't get solved, believe me, he'll move you on in his time, but he's going to build character in the process. Let me ask you this. How many have had a job or something they just didn't like and a situation based on work, but then you allowed God to work in your circumstance, and you either got a promotion or a job opportunity. How many have ever had that? See, how many people? If you've never trusted that, that God that way, you should see all the hands that just went up. Because God will. He'll build character on the inside. Let me ask you this. How many here that, that your, uh, the place of employment did not change, but God changed things or promoted you? How many had that happen? Look at that. More than half that raised their hands. So many times the problem is you. Okay, I just said. All right, let's read on. And it goes on. It says, dissensions, heresies, envy. Am I an envious person? Murder. Jesus said murder's in the heart. Understand, this is all in the heart. You get that, right? Drunkenness, revelries. Drunkenness and revelries go together. And you may not think about that too much. Say, well, you know, I don't drink or, or whatever. And, or you may be judgmental and you saw somebody have a glass of wine and say, see, they're drunk. No, that, that's not what that is. Understand what drunkenness is. That's a person who cannot control themselves, who you see till all hours of the night dancing on the tables at the bar. If that was you last night, let's pray. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Understand, it's a lifestyle. I mean, people who live this way, they're like this if they're not drinking. They just get worse when they start drinking. People say, well, you know, when you drink, it makes you a different person. Oh, no, the real you comes out. You get drunk, there's nothing holding you back. And the Bible says don't live that way. It's wrong. Loud. <laughs> I think of so many things, so many parties and things I was at in my B.C. days. You know what that means, right? Before Christ. I've arrived now, so I'm perfect. But, but I remember those days just as clear as it was yesterday. You think, you, you all know, well, maybe you all don't know, but some of you know. I know this is Resurrection Life Church in Traverse City. You probably all know. But anyway, you know, it's kind of loud, annoying, boisterous, drunk, frenzy, guilty. Yeah, amen. And the, and the thing is, if you're like that, you can turn around. And if you need help, we want to help you. If you're addicted to alcohol, we want to pray the word of God over you and help you get the deliverance you need and then walk you through it. But if you don't have a problem in that area and you just enjoy being stupid, then stop. Because you can. And nobody's getting blessed by you dancing on the tables. All right. It says this, all these things I've told you and I tell you again that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said, pray this way, your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray the kingdom of God would come from heaven and invade earth through our lives. And when we live the way we just read, when we're not allowing God to grow character and grace and compassion and righteousness on the inside of us, and we're living this way, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. Oh, I know God may use you from time to time. And we say, well, surely God uses me. Well, if you live this way and God is using you, can you imagine what he'd do if you'd allow him to build character on the inside? God's a God of order. Didn't you ever notice that? In fact, the Bible says that when we gather together in a meeting like this, let everything done be done orderly. And so, you know, uh, uh, Tasha had, I almost called you Tanya, sorry. Tasha or Tanya or Tesla or whatever I choose to call you. All right, that's your name today. See, Tasha knows me, so she, she's got, see, the grace and the compassion is oozing out of her right now. That fire in her eyes is the love that she has for me right now. 
You know, I didn't know she was going to pray and have that word today. In fact, I didn't know Tony was going to sing because I have no idea what's going on. Okay. And so, but I saw her up here, and so she knows get my attention, worship leader's attention. And, and, if, we, and if we would have said not now, I mean, I do that last week with someone. I remember I said not for this. Or maybe it was Wednesday, a lot of people. And we believe that things are done in order, but how many know somebody has, a, has to stop it? If you don't think God's a God of order, look at the universe. Take a look when you enjoy some of the weather today because, hey, it's going to break 50. This is Michigan, y'all. Let's get the T-shirts and the shorts out and the sandals. Start wearing them. Not me. I'm not going to do that, but you can. It's too cold for that. <laughs> but if you just get out and you take a look at creation, you can't possibly think that God is not a God of order and discipline. His whole kingdom makes sense. Now, the way he operates may not make sense to us, but everything's in perfect balance. And that's what he wants for your life. If he's going to work in your life the way he wants to and get the ultimate fruit in your life, he wants perfect balance. I mean, no, it's not just a tennis shoe. It's something that God wants to work in your life because he wants the kingdom of heaven just coming through you. And the truth is we need to take time and ask God to reveal areas that we've repressed memories or events that have caused us to be bitter, to become self-consumed, that have caused us to just disconnect from people because we've had it can we just be honest sometimes you just had it with people is that can we be honest i mean it, it's true but people aren't the enemy you realize that don't you they're just people that need the love of god the bible says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood but with principalities and powers of darkness you don't have an original thought in your brain i know that that just hurt somebody's feelings this morning but it says in ecclesiastes that there's nothing new under the sun so that thought you had you're not the originator of that thought. I hope you realize that. Your thoughts are either coming from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ or the Father of lies, which is Satan or Lucifer. Jesus was very clear. He's the Father of lies. You're either getting the truth or you're believing a lie. So it's so important that we live disciplined lives, that we read the word, that we're praying, that we're fasting, that we want to have a goal of being a person that people like to be around by the end of the year, more than they did at the beginning of the year. I mean, that's a good goal. Oh, Lord, just make that my prayer that by the end of this year, people would like me better. That's a good prayer. It really is. And God will move through prayers like that. Trust me, I've prayed that prayer. Every Sunday morning, I pray that prayer. <laughs> just waking up that person in the back row over there. Because we store all these things up, and then we're mistreated again, and it drags us right back to that last time that somebody mistreated us. And the truth is, God doesn't remember our past. God doesn't keep track of our sins, and he wants us to live the same way. Oh, you may never forget an event. Like I mentioned, even if you lose someone to death or something, it's so hard to, to get past that. But God can help you that even when you remember that, that you won't have bitterness, you won't have unforgiveness, you won't have sorrow that has no hope. The Bible says we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. Or there's sorrow in our lives, but we have hope. Because God is on the inside of us, and so we have hope. It says in Micah 7, 19, He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast out our sins into the depths of the sea. See, God wants to, somebody said this, God casts our sin in the sea of forgetfulness, and then he puts a no fishing sign up. He doesn't go and drag them things up. Listen, if you think God is coming to you in your prayer time and saying, you really blew it yesterday. You are miserable. You don't deserve anything good. That is not God. I hope you realize that. That is the devil. You need to say, shut up. <laughs> shut up. I'm a child of God, and I am blessed and highly favored, not only for me, but for the generations to come. Because today, I'm putting my shoes on, and I'm going to walk all over the devil, and every person that comes in contact with me is going to be better because they were around me. So, God, use me in my generosity. Use me in my words. Oh, I don't even have time to get to that. We're running out of time. You're all listening slow today. <laughs> but it's so important. Listen, the words that we speak, I'm going to just get to that because I have to. We cannot fight fire with fire. We just want to put our boxing gloves on and just get that person that mistreated us. You can't live like that. You've got to forgive people. You've got to start to see people the way God sees people. 
Because people mistreat you. How many have ever heard hurt people hurt people? It's so true. People that mistreat you, they need the love of God. They don't need you to fight fire with fire. That doesn't do anything. It makes it worse. You need to love them. Because walking in the Spirit will change the way you and I treat people. Three things we need to do. Jude 20, he says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Three things there. Build yourselves up, pray in the Holy Spirit, and keep yourselves. Number one, build yourself up. Well, first of all, receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible's very clear. Two places I'll mention quickly, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. So many people say, well, I received the Holy Spirit when I, was, when I uh, prayed for Jesus to come into my heart. The Spirit of God leads you into that relationship. Absolutely true. Jesus said nobody can come to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. But if you look in the book of Acts, it's very clear. And Jesus even talked, and John the Baptist bore witness of this. He says, I baptize you with water, but one who comes will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and what? Fire. Showing that there was a difference. And in the book of Acts... The apostles, the early church, they come across people uh, in a couple of different situations. One, in Acts chapter 10, they say that they were just baptized in the name of Jesus. And so the Bible says, well, let's find some water, get them baptized. And the Bible says the Holy Ghost came, and they baptized them in the Holy Spirit. You see three different things there. They believed on Jesus, they were baptized in water, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, it says, well, how did you believe? They said, well, we just believed in John's baptism and got water baptized. John's baptism was water baptism. And they said, oh, well, let's go. Let's, let's get this thing going. And they prayed. The Bible said the Holy Ghost came and fell on the Gentiles also. And they magnified God and prayed with other tongues. Now, now you may not believe in praying in other tongues. I, I get that. There's been weird stuff that's happened. And, and it's weird, okay? I'm just going to say it is. But we believe it in this church. And, and right after service, we have a prayer time. If you want to know more about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I assure you, and I'm not going to teach on it in depth today, we will do that. We do that at least once or twice a year around our baptism services when we have water baptism. But the Bible is very clear. It's something, and it will help you. It will help you win this battle we're talking about. Receive the Holy Spirit. Get deliverance. And here's the thing. Praying in tongues, when I pray in other tongues in my private uh, prayer time, what starts to happen is God will direct my thoughts. When I'm confused, when I don't like what I'm seeing, I pray in other tongues, and God starts to calm me. He starts to bring wisdom. He starts to bring me to the Word of God, which I've read daily for 28 years. It all, it all comes together. And then he starts to give me wisdom, insight, strength, gives me peace, unspeakable, full of joy. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you build yourself up in the Holy Spirit, it breaks the grip of the enemy in your life. Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in the Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 10.38 says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all. Somebody say all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus needed to be anointed by the Holy Spirit from God. Think about that. So that he could go about healing all who were oppressed. When I see a situation, is God going to use me to change it because of the compassion that he's putting on it? Humanly, it's impossible. But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, power comes from on how to change your life. Number two, pray in the Holy Spirit, which I just talked about. Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know when we should pray. How many don't know what to pray most of the time? Can we just put our pride down and be honest? I mean, most of us, if, if we prayed about everything we knew how to pray, it would take 30 seconds. Okay, let's go on. For we do not know what we should pray, but you can pray hours. You start praying in the Spirit. You got an open Bible. You got a pen. You got a pen. Oh, you know, uh, birthday girl's going like this. Yeah, she's going like that. It's true. She knows. I see that girl. Oh, man. I remember when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's like, boo! Fire. Somebody say fire. fire. It says, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Do you see that? He searches our hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He searches our hearts and knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Bible says that we should speak, that we should pray, that we should sing in other tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians chapter 5, 19. 
And then three, keep yourself, James 3. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that, we may, that they may obey us. And we turn the whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member, boasts great things. See how great a force a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. And sets on fire the course of nature. It is a set on fire by hell. So the Bible is saying here that the tongue is a fire and set on fire by hell. We have a covenant that was made for us by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In the old covenant, they would circumcise the male boys, the babies, with the circumcision of the flesh. The Bible says we are circumcised by the Spirit of God. And it's interesting, we're talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're talking about praying in other tongues. And, and we've talked all through this series how God wants to get a hold of our heart because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Some of you have been here for mostly, so you got it. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then we see here, it's so important what you say because out of your heart is what comes out. When you fill your heart with the Spirit of God, with the Word of God, oh, you may be facing a terrible situation, but what comes out first is the Word of God. And some of you just need to bite your tongue sometimes because the way you talk to other people is just not nice. Let's throw that in there real quick. I mean, listen to this, Proverbs 10, 19. It's not in your notes, but you can jot this down. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. I like that one. If you always got to talk, just saying. But he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is worth. Do you see that again? The tongue of the wise is choice silver, but the heart of the wicked. Do you see the correlation? The heart and the tongue, they work together. It's one and the same with, with God. Your tongue exposes what's in your heart. It says, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. There you go again. The, the words of the wise, what, feed many. God wants us to speak life into every situation. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life from the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So God wants us to grow in all these areas. But three things that we need to do is build ourselves up, receive the Holy Spirit, pray in other tongues, and allow God to get control of our tongue because our words are just contrastingly productive. Productive in one way, counterproductive in another, so we need to learn how to keep ourselves. I could go on and on about the tongue, but we don't have time. Let me just say this. There's four types of people. Number one is a person who thinks before they speak. I want to be that. Number two is a person who thinks while they're speaking. I've had times it's like, did I just say that? I mean, how about you? Your ear comes off. It's like, okay. Number three, this is usually not very good. Those who think after they speak. But this is the worst, those who just speak. As, as Christians, we shouldn't be people, be people that just speak. And I don't know why that came out of my mouth. Well, you should know because it's your mouth and it's your heart. And you're going to bear its fruit one way or the other. We don't have any more time. Let me pray for you. Father, in this place, I ask that you would show us areas where you want to work in our hearts. We surrender to you and ask you to work grace and compassion and righteousness on the inside of us. And Father God, we would build ourselves up in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit of God and keep ourselves and let our tongue be something that brings life and not death. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.